Well, the Dunkley by-election on Saturday will set the political agenda for 2024. It will be the first major test of both Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton's leadership. There's big political capital at stake. The rumour mill went into overdrive this week amid speculation Albo was going to call an early election. But is Peter Dutton ready for that. As opposition leader, Dutton has come out strong on issues like border protection, released immigration detainees, national security. But according to the polls, he hasn't yet done enough to convince voters he should be the alternative PM. So our first question for the jury, would Peter Dutton make a good Prime Minister? Joining us to discuss is former Speaker of the House Bronwyn Bishop and self-described Labor tragic Sam Crosby. Good to see you both. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Bronwyn, we'll start with you. As we move on to a possible election, whether it be this year or next year, is Peter Dutton's image the problem moving forward? Because either people don't seem to know who he is or he's perceived as a real attack dog. Is that his problem? No, I don't think either of those things are true. I think Peter Dutton has got strength, conviction, and most importantly, he loves his country. And he's prepared to go to really strong advocacy for the Australian people so that they are first and foremost in his mind. As a former policeman, he's looked evil in the face. He knows compassion for people. And so, in the words of the vernacular we often hear, you know, do, do uh, politicians have real, real experience? He does. Whereas we've got a prime minister, who doesn't? But the important thing is that he will take on the issues. He won't divide people on race basis. He will take on the question of the energy crisis and embrace the question of nuclear modular power. He will indeed look at border, border protection, of course, is vital. And there are so many issues where he's strong. Yeah. And I always remember an election when Bob Carr beat John Fay. Yeah. John Fay had a 60% approval rating they, all the ads were shot of Bob Carr in the dark because he wasn't a pretty face, <laughs> but he won. <laughs> but he won. There you go. Uh, so, Sam, then why don't you think that Peter Dutton is the answer Australia needs? So, look, you're right. I am a self-described Labor tragic. You, know, my, <laughs> you admit my... it. So, you admit an it. Ex candidate. Be honest. <laughs> no, 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 there, no happily, Sam. happily. I'm an ex-candidate. I'm They're literally lost. a card-carrying member. My <laughs> yeah. wife is in the New South Wales yes, government, so she right? Is. So, so put my cards on the table. That said, I consider Dom Perrottet to be one of my best friends. Yeah. I have utmost respect for uh, Bronwyn's former boss in John Howard or for Gladys Berejiklian or Mike Baird, right? So, cards on the table. I'm a Labor voter, but I can still respect the other side, awesome. you know, from time to time. In this case, I don't, right? And it's not <laughs> just because of his history as a minister, which we can go through some of the highlights. Which is an excellent history. Like. Sure, let's go through it. You know, in, in 2013, he was the health minister of Australia. Voted last... Last, the worst health minister by not 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 by Labor tragics, mm. not by Labor members, by Australian doctors in Ausdoc magazine since polling began 35 years They're ago. They're the same doctors who are now not having bulk billing because uh, they can't afford to have their. These are Australian open, are doctors. These, these are Australian are, these doctors are the ones, in 2013. These are the ones who, who now have co-payments, are they? Last. These are the ones who have co-payments. This, co this is the same guy who was immigration minister mm. oversaw a spying operation on Sarah Hansen Young when she went to one of our immigration bases. Now I think since this, Watergate. This, We've all acknowledged that spying on your political is, enemies, regardless of if they're Greens, Labor, Democrats, Republicans, whatever, is bad. We can all agree <laughs> on that, Bron. Come on. Sam, spying I, on your, I've got to tell you... Spying on your political opponents is bad. He has not been, as has your current Prime Minister or the current Prime Minister, Albo the Trot, a history of the far left of the socialist regime. Mm. And he hasn't changed his spots. So if we're going to trade those sorts of things, it's pointless. The question is, would Peter Dutton make a good Prime Minister? That's I'm the question. I'm putting to you, yes, he will, because he's got strength, he's got conviction, and he loves is his country. Is this the same strength and conviction that in 2018 led him to lead the charge against African gangs in the Victorian election? That, that, that same election that Dan Andrews won the the massively question, Sam, because of does, Peter Dutton's... Does, does Sam have a point here? Bronwyn? No, he doesn't. Because this is what no, it goes back doesn't. to my first point. He has, there's a perception that he's this attack dog. No, he's a, he's, his image is one of strength. And as I've said, he's the man who's looked evil in the face. He yeah. understands when there is a need for law and order to be strong. For instance, he and Jacinta Price have both asked that there be uh, a royal commission 
into the rape and abuse of Aboriginal Correct. children, which the Labor government refuses to have. Yes. But the reason he wants that is because he well, understands what is happening well, to those children. We, we of course know this Saturday is a big one. It's the Dunkley by-election. Uh, Sam, surely a, a narrow loss for Anthony Albanese would easily put the focus back on Peter Dutton. Because, because it really would be a reflection of Peter Dutton, how far he's come. Look, I, I, I don't know, right? At the end of the day, I think by-elections are largely um, uh, reflections of that community, those candidates and this particular point. You know, we might not have an election for six, eight, ten, twelve months, right? right. So it's very so hard... So you, you don't think it's a by-election on, on, on Albanese, on his leadership? I, I, I don't. I don't. And I know, I know that might, you know, he might win in double-digit margins then I'll be regretting that we didn't say, oh, well, that was absolutely a, a referendum on Albo and, and Dutton. I genuinely think uh, local by-elections like this need to be looked at in the context but, that they're in. Robin, what do you think? Because if we look back to, say, the Aston by-election, there were calls for Peter Dutton to resign because the Liberals lost so badly. But now the focus is, well, if Anthony Albanese wins, but even only on a, the slightest margin, that could be fatal for him. Does it turn back to Peter Dutton? Well, the truth about this by-election is that Peter Murphy, mm -hmm. who was the member who so sadly and tragically died, yes. was a very brave woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she showed courage. She kept representing her people when she was so ill. Mm -hmm. Now, there's going to be a great respect for that memory. Of course. I have no doubt about that at all. So what we're looking at is... Um, the margin of the swing. And I think that people will be uh, making judgments about Mr Albanese in this. They'll be making judgments on the way that he appointed uh, the Minister for Immigration, who's the man who represented the people who came off the Tampa. Mm. He deliberately put in someone who was pro-refugee and anti-border security. Yes. So those sorts of... And letting out 147 people, which is not necessary, including murderers and pedophiles. Yeah. People will make judgments about those sorts Correct. of things. And the, the idea of cost of living. That's it. But that, that'll be a reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. I want to go to some of the jurors now, see how they're feeling. Hugo, do you like Peter Dutton? Look, I think he, uh, you know, like Bron was saying, I think he shows a lot of strength um, and he shows a lot of character. I think that, um, you know, his record with borders and immigration is pretty hard to argue against. He had a lot of success um, leading the charge with that. And, you know, you, you can see now with the Labor government that's come in, um, they're, they're struggling to cope with that. And I think that that's um, going to be a really strong basis for him to um, use is his strength at borders and immigration in particular. Yeah, that's a very good point. What about you, David? How are you feeling about Peter Dutton? The question posed is, will he make a good Prime Minister? Correct. Not will he make a better Prime Minister, mm -hmm. but he will make a good Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And with um, due respect to our current politicians, I think we have a dearth of intellect and foresight at the moment. If we elect stronger politicians, we have a better Prime Minister, a better government. That's where I'm coming from at the moment. OK, look, that's, that's a good point. Um, Vicky, up the back, how are you feeling about the possibility of a Peter Dutton Prime Ministership? Look, I think the man's got compassion. I know perhaps sometimes that doesn't come through. Um, he is very good with border control. He looked after, when he was with Immigration, Border Control and Defence Minister, I felt he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think he has a passion for our country yeah. and it's very admirable. Yeah, see, that, that's, I feel like that's an interesting point. He has passion for mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. He's been very strong when it comes to the culture wars debate, very strong on borders. Is that going to resonate with voters between now and an election, Sam? We'll, we'll see. We'll see is the answer. You know, I mean, obviously that's going to be the frame through which the Liberal Party wants to frame mm. the upcoming election, obviously. You know, I think, honestly, from my perspective, I think the greatest uh, threat to Australia, the greatest threat to Western democracy is this increasing polarisation. Uh, you know, this Trump is, is part of this yep. that increasingly stretches us to a point where we can't agree with each other and we can't have points of commonality mm. between ourselves. And I do think Peter Dutton plays into that frame. He, you know, he, oh, he was one of the only members that walked out of the uh, 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 stolen generation apology. One of the only. 
Now, you su subsequently come back and said, oh, that was a problem, I shouldn't have done that, you know, that was a mistake. Right, so but, it's got know, the capacity to do no, that. No, sure, but, but at a time, at a time when the entire country was stopping, at a time that, when the entire country no, was stopping, no, Martin same. Place was closed this, down. This is I the watched important, it at, at important Terminal issue 1 here in, is in... will he make a good Prime Minister? The answer is yes. But he doesn't have the and judgment for a And he does for cares for his country in a way that... We, look, we see the younger generation who are... Their grades are down... Why would young people want to aspire when they're told it's a rotten country, there's no leadership Who at said the top? That? Well, Why, you've got a when, Prime Minister how, who doesn't what, what, stick what up this, for it. What is this straw man that you're coming up with? You've got a Prime when, Minister who doesn't go against anti Semitism. Please show me when said that this is a rotten country. He doesn't and go I, I will because vote Because he does Peter nothing Duck. to change for it. He, does, he doesn't stand up on the difficult issues. When there's an issue right. that is good, they say, oh, we're doing the same as the government. When it's bad for the government, they say, oh, we inherited it. They can't well, even take look, responsibility for government. Well, well, look, we can debate this all day, and I feel like we're going to be debating this a lot more often between now and ele an election. But you've both had your say. It's time to call on the jury. Jurors, you have 10 seconds to deliberate your verdict. The question, would Peter Dutton make a good Prime Minister? Jury members, what have you decided? All yes, but one no. You all believe, or the majority of you believe, that Peter Dutton would indeed make a good Prime Minister. David, no. Mm. Why? Well, I said before, yeah. we have a dearth of intellect and foresight at the moment. Yeah. If the question, would he make a better Prime yes. Minister than the one we've got now, then we could have another debate. Mm. But uh, I still think that what we have at the moment is rather a poor crop. And I think the same in the United States. They're yeah, the best of a bad bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Dana, you voted yes? Yes. I think um, Peter Dutton's real-world experience, he's run a business, he's been in the police force, he's more in touch with, you know, what's going on. I just think we've got... With the Labor Party, you've just got people who've gone straight from university to politics and they've got no real world experience yeah. and I think that's where there's a disconnect. Yeah, absolutely. And Julie, you voted yes. Why do you think Peter Dutton would make a good Prime Minister? Well, um, I think that he will be able to put forward the plan that does not involve union domination. At the moment, we've got a really big problem with the economy and I think he's showing the trust and leadership to put forward a plan that can bring us forward because right now we're in a bit of trouble. Yeah, well, fair points. It's fair points. But, look, it's going to be interesting to see what happens between now and then. Dunkley, one to watch. I know you said probably not, but I think everyone will be really eyeing that one off, uh, Sam Crosby. Sam Crosby, Bronwyn Bishop, great to speak with you both. Thank you so much for joining us. The cost of living crisis has claimed a major scalp. Woolworth CEO Brad Banducci following a disastrous media appearance this week. I shouldn't have said that. Angus, are, you, are we going to leave it in there if we are? Well, I mean, it, it, we're on the record. You said it. I mean, you know, let's let's move on. But yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm done, guys. Uh, you're walking out, really? No, no, no. Can we just talk to no, no, Brad for a second? Whilst an undeniable PR train wreck, it's not a fix for eye-watering grocery prices. So who is to blame for your hip pocket pain? Supermarkets are clearly in the firing line. The ACCC and a Senate inquiry will examine prices and competition and no doubt increase pressure on Coles and Woolies to pass on lower costs from suppliers and not increase their profit margins. But some economists claim supermarkets are simply undeserving scapegoats in the inflation blame game. Our next question for the jury, are supermarkets ripping off customers and suppliers? Representing the no case, we have Warren Hogan, Chief Economic Advisor at Judo Bank, and Dr Mark Humphrey Jenner, Associate Professor of Finance at UNSW Business School. He's prosecuting the yes argument. Thank you so much to the both of you for, for joining us on what's been a very topical issue, you'd say, for the last few weeks. Mark, we already know that Australia's supermarket industry, it is dominated by Coles and Woolworths, who account for about two-thirds of grocery spending. That is a lot. Are they ripping us off? Well, absolutely, they account for two-thirds of all what consumers are spending. Aldi and IGA only a tiny bit. Now, the real issue here is that Coles and Woolworths are really ripping off suppliers. Not necessarily customers as much, but definitely suppliers, and they're getting a raw end of the deal. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it's because the profit margins on many of these supermarkets simply aren't that large. 
So say, for example, we're looking at the net profit margin. It's only about 2.6% for Kohl's, 2.7% for Woolworths. So not making a massive profit per se, but what that means is that when their costs are going up, well, they need to find a way to survive. Mm. And the way they survive is by ripping off their supplies, mm. ripping off the cherry farmers or the dairy farmers or all of the supplies that are facing increasing pressure to lower their costs or to not take a price hike so that Coles and Woods can maintain their profit margin. OK, I understand your point. So, Warren, then in this cost of living crisis that we are in, is it fair to then point the finger at supermarkets? Well, look, I don't think there's any evidence to say they're ripping off their customers. Okay. Um, to the point, the only way you could argue that there's a systematic price gouging going on of customers is to see super normal profits. And it just simply does not exist in the supermarket chains. They are really just returning something similar to other similar companies in Australia and uh, retailers overseas. So you, you get no evidence of, of systematic price gouging. But to the point already made, mm -hmm it is less clear on suppliers. Now, we know that prior to the pandemic, the way that Coles and Woolworths really made sure their customers got the lowest price possible was putting pressure on their suppliers, for good or for bad. Now, of course, there's the issue of the farmers through to the big food manufacturers. Less evidence of that in the last few years, although it can't be ruled out, but certainly no gouging systematically of customers in the last few years. OK, Mark, what do you think then of Anthony Albanese coming out quite strongly and saying that, yes, it actually is the supermarket's fault and he's the one that's called these inquiries? Is he right? Well, Anthony Albanese is right to look at supermarkets, but he's looking at the wrong thing. He should be looking at their conduct with respect of suppliers, mm -hmm. not so much the consumers as much. Right. So absolutely there is a question to answer here. Now, the problem with Anthony Albanese's inquiry is to some extent it looks like he's deflecting blame. It looks like he is trying to perhaps shift the blame for inflation to someone else. And to be clear here, well, there were dairy price wars. Between 2011 and 2019, supermarkets kept the price of dairy at $1. That was myopic because a lot of dairy farmers went out of business. We saw about 2,300 dairy farms close. Wow. They were squeezing their supplies. And as a result, you end up with a situation now where the wholesale milk prices had to increase, thereby forcing milk prices to go up which means that due to that myopic short-termism, well, effectively, now they're kind of ripping off customers indirectly because prices have to go up because of their conduct with suppliers. OK, let's uh, go to the jury. Cassandra, do you feel like the major, the big two, Woolies and Coles, are, are ripping off not only suppliers but also customers? I think there's a valid argument... Um to call out competition. I think we need more competition, supermarket competition in the market. Mm -hmm. But I also think what's fueling inflation is high energy costs, high fuel costs, and also high employment costs. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, to, this is why Albanese and Labor are trying to deflect from that. So it's also classic, it goes back to class warfare and uh, um, Labor governments trying to blame companies mm -hmm. for their own failings. Mm -hmm. Alan, do you think that supermarkets are being caught up in this blame game, or you think it's fair? No, I think they, are, uh, they have uh, they have been ripping, ripping people off. They, you know, they they should uh, they are almost like a cartel. They they don't have any, enough competition. Yeah. And I think there should be a lot of competitors in the market, and that's where we stand to win. Yeah. What, what do you think about that, Warren? Do you think that supermarkets are actually getting caught up in this blame game when it comes to inflation? Yeah, look, there is no doubt that we have got the most concentrated supermarket industry in the world. So, as you said, two-thirds for Coles and Woolies. Yeah. In the UK, that's one-third for the top two. Mm -hmm. In the US, 30%. Then you go to the top four, which includes IGA, Metcash and Aldi. Mm -hmm. We're at 80%, mm -hmm. whereas in the UK, it's at 60%, the US, it's 40%. So, there's no doubt there's concentration there. But I would argue... It's been pretty well managed. I mean, this is a tough thing. You know, ge geographically large country with big logistics and supply chains all throughout the country, I think no one would argue that they haven't improved the quality of their product over the last, say, 20 years. Sure. So, look, I think they need to make a return on capital. There's no evidence of excess profits. And so I think it's very dangerous to sort of think that they're, you know, we've got to regulate them. Could there be more competition? Of course. But is it going to change the numbers? Is it going to change the result? I'm not sure it would. And I'm not sure that you... I think you would have risks with that if you forced competition by, for example, breaking up Coles and Woolworths across state borders or something. But is reform needed? I don't think it is. I think okay. we... Apart from on the supply side, I do agree with Mark on that front. It's yes. the supply side that the focus yeah. needs to be. A f final from you. So, reform? There could be reform about the supply side. In okay. particular, needs to be reform about how those supermarkets treat 
their suppliers, yeah. how they're providing fees or providing funding or providing the capital, rather, the costs upfront and quickly enough to the suppliers okay. about how they're negotiating and passing on the price hikes to suppliers. All right, well, look, you've both had your say. It's time to call on the jury. Jurors, you have 10 seconds to deliberate the following question. Are supermarkets ripping off customers and suppliers? Time is up. What is the jury's verdict? OK, we've got five no's and the rest of you say yes, that supermarkets are indeed ripping off customers and suppliers. Andrew, you said no. Why don't you think that's the case? Companies like Woolworths and Coles, they're huge employers, you know, over 10,000 staff each. You've got people in warehouses, you've got people in uh, the stores that pack shelves, all these things. They have to account for costs at some stage, so there's always going to be a squeeze on everything. At the end of the day, yes, we may pay more, but everything is in the one spot for us. So that's what probably lucky. So we pay for that little bit of convenience. You can shop around and maybe save a little bit by going to different places, but make that trade off yourself. That's something you've got to decide. That's an interesting point. We're paying for convenience. Do you agree, Mark? Well, certainly, say we're looking at a local location, we'll often have Coles and Woolworths in a very similar uh, vicinity, similar with the Audi, particularly in inner city locations. So people often are going to the one that is more convenient to them, the one that is closer to them. So absolutely, people do pay for convenience, mm -hmm. but in some locations, particularly regional areas, mm -hmm. It's not so easy, yep. i.e. Coles and Woolworths might be quite distant. Yeah, that's a fair call. And Santhera, what do you think? Do you think that we're being ripped off? I think, I, I think so. They are, uh, they are charging more. They're charging uh, cons more. Cons consumers. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it's an interesting debate and uh, one that we find ourselves in in this cost of living crisis. Uh, Warren Hogan and Mark Humphrey-Jetta, great to speak with you both on this. Thank you so much for joining us.